the female blue morpho butterflies like to hang out a lot closer to the floor of the forests, and they'll sort of chill on tree stumps normally, but they do move closer to the tree canopies when it's time to lay their eggs. This is The Butterfly Effect, a podcast that shows the big impact a small action can do. Tali Orad is talking to those special people that make a difference with nature and trees. Welcome everyone to The Butterfly Effect. My name is Tali Orad. I'm your host and your butterfly here. Today I'm super excited to have another host on this podcast and an animal and nature lover, Skyly Smith, together with Sky. I will host this special episode just for you. She is 25 years old and is currently applying to grad school to focus on conservation biology. So we're all crossing our fingers she's going to make the cut. She's also the host of the Wildlife Weirdos podcast, an educational podcast on animals. On her show, she tries to find out all the cool and weird and interesting things about animals and share it. I'm so excited to have Sky here to host it with me this very special episode. So welcome, Sky, to The Butterfly Effect. Hi, Tally. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to, to share what I found out about the, the butterfly that I'm going over. I'm, I'm psyched. What, just before we dive into that butterfly, what made you start? What made you start this podcast? So I'm in university right now trying to go for grad school, like you said, for conservation biology. But before I decided on conservation biology, I was just wanting to get a degree in biology so I could do something to help. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. one of the classes I had to take for my degree was called biogeography. And in that class, they mentioned um, a lot about uh, conservation itself and a lot of things that humans are doing that are kind of negatively impacting the earth. And at that point, I'd found out that conservation biology was something that was really interesting. And also in the class itself, my teacher had mentioned that um, uh, sea otters are actually keystone predators, which I thought was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. Because you don't <laughs> think of otters as predators. You think of them as cute little sea weasels. Right. Apparently, they're keystone predators. And I was like, this is so cool. I, I never would have would have known this. And then I was like... If I wouldn't have known this, someone who just really likes animals, I can't imagine other people who aren't as into animals would know it either. So it'd be really cool if I could maybe help them learn more about it. And one of my friends actually had recently started a podcast. And I was like, that'd be a really interesting thing to do. I could do a podcast. I like teaching right. people about animals. I like learning about animals. And this would combine both of them. And I was kind of hoping that maybe... You know, some of the animals that maybe aren't as popular, like uh, possums or um, some insects or something like that, maybe people learn to love a little bit more or they'll just want to be a little bit better in their conservation with the world itself. And maybe I can help one person just be better and that would be worth it. That's beautiful. That's the butterfly effect. <laughs> Which, which brings me to, to the next thing. I mean, you dedicate an episode for an animal at your show and at this point with our joint episode of The Butterfly Effect and Wildlife Weirdos, we thought that because this is The Butterfly Effect, butterfly makes the best sense to talk on. And it's not actually not an animal, but an insect, mm -hmm. of course, in context of trees. So please, we, we hope you're going to like it. Actually, the butterflies play an important role in their own forest and in the environment. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, let Sky lead the way. Sky, the floor is yours. The butterfly I wanted to talk about is something called the blue morpho butterfly. And it's also known as the Manalis blue morpho. And its scientific name is Morphinae, which is its subfamily, Morpho Manalis. So that's kind of where it gets its name from. Pretty cool. This butterfly specifically has a wingspan of about 12 centimeters or about 4.75 inches and its dorsal or its top side of its wings are like a really, really bright iridescent blue with a thin black edge on the end. And it has um, sort of a spotty brown underside of their wings or their ventral surface of their wings. And that helps them blend in with the trees and leaves around them. So when they land on something and they close up their wings, you don't see them. It looks more like uh, an eye or a dead leaf or something like that. So they use that to help camouflage themselves and protect themselves. They mostly just kind of tend to eat the fruit that falls on the tree floors, so they really need that protection. Mm -hmm. 
the wings of the butterfly in general, just any butterfly, is already an incredible structure on its own. It's so cool. Imagine if you just had little fairy wings that could take you wherever you wanted. It's incredible to think of. But this butterfly specifically has even cooler wings because it's got iridescent blue wings, which is actually caused by the microstructure of the wings itself. And scientists have used all sorts of different microscopes to study them and learn more about them and whatnot. And we still aren't really entirely done studying them anyway. And you've probably actually seen these butterflies before. I know I said iridescent blue, but if you can think of in a museum or uh, as a painting, or even I know some people will use uh, deceased ones as decoration, like in resin or whatnot, and they just, it's bright blue. It's absolutely gorgeous. If you can picture a bright blue butterfly, that's probably this butterfly. <laughs> blue is my favorite color, so I can definitely picture that. See, it's tied with green for me, so I'm enjoying it too. <laughs> <laughs> butterfly wings are covered in scales. All butterfly wings are, if you didn't know that already. And if you ever, maybe as a child, kind of caught a butterfly and noticed a soft powder left on your fingers afterward, that's the scales. And that Not fairy dust. Yeah, it's not fairy dust. And it made me really <laughs> sad when I found out that it was the wing scales. I was like, I'm so sorry, butterflies. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought it was cool that I could catch butterflies, and now I just feel terrible. So this butterfly specifically, I did say it has in more interesting wings than normal butterflies. It has multi-layered scales on its wings, which causes the really cool color. The true color itself actually changes a little bit when it's viewed from different angles, sort of like a holographic card or something. You look at it one way, it looks like this. You look at it a different way, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. That color, that structure itself is called structural color. And the top layer of scales, or the cover scales, are completely transparent. They have no pigment at all, but they're slightly iridescent. And the bottom layer, or the ground scales, have the blue colors and more iridescence. So it's kind of like a double whammy iridescence, which makes it even fancier, I suppose. Mm -hmm. This genus specifically, the Morpho genus, uh, are known for their wings having many different properties, like being hydrophobic, which means they are, at the very least, water resistant, but... Usually when something's hydrophobic, it it's completely just doesn't like water at all, like a waterproof jacket or something. They're very light, but they're sturdy. Also like a waterproof jacket, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> they're thermally regulated. It helps them stay like warm if it's cold or maybe a little cooler if it's warmer. They're also a little bit self-cleaning, so they can kind of help themselves stay clean enough to fly. And of course, they're bright blue and they're gorgeous. There's also still studies on wings, on these wings specifically, to understand them in their entirety, like I said. Because, for all you know, we might be able to use some information that we gained by studying them in other aspects of our lives. Like, for instance, using structural color ourselves in, like, I think, um, I think one of the things I saw was, like, gas detection or something like that. I'm really not sure how that works, but it sounded cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I mean, I, one thing that I know is that butterflies cannot fly if the air temperature falls under 55 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And since butterflies are cold-blooded animals, they cannot regulate the body temperature, which renders them completely immobile in cold weather. Well, and if you think about it, they're also all a lot smaller than us. And we sometimes have issues going about our lives when it's that cold. I couldn't imagine yeah. doing that when I am super tiny, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why I never see fairies, because it's always either too hot or too cold here. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> and I know many scientists uh, keep on studying butterflies, and they for years thought that they are completely deaf until the first... Uh, identified butterfly ears in 2012, which is pretty That is awesome. so cool. Maybe instead of saying it's the bee's knees, we should say it's the butterfly ears. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> These specific butterflies will actually lay their eggs individually underneath on the bottom side of leaves. And their eggs are like really, really tiny and they sort of, they're sort of like a pastel green color and they kind of look like dewdrops, which I think is just the cutest thing ever. The caterpillars that are hatched are, um, they're sort of like a brown color, and they have these bright green spots on them, and they'll start eating immediately, which means that they don't have any time to worry about defenses, so they also have these bristles that kind of irritate anything that touches them. So if something tries to eat it, they'll hit the bristles, and they'll be like, oh, I don't like that, I'm going away, and they'll leave them alone. Their eggs are usually laid on the plants that they like to eat, because they like to eat specific plants. Three of those are Urethroxylum, 
Dalbergia, and Fabicae. And they like to eat the newly emerged leaves, like the fresh newborn leaves, because mm -hmm. they're a lot more nutritious and they're a little bit softer and easier to eat themselves. What's their lifespan? So uh, their lifespan is only about 115 days total. And only three to four of those weeks that they're alive are as adult butterflies. So they have to really kind of push when they're caterpillars to eat as much as they can. And when they're butterflies to eat as much as they can and to reproduce as much as they can, because they have such a short period of time on the earth. And that's also why they really depend on their environment being healthy and being taken care of because mm -hmm. being so small and having such a short lifespan, if they're not able to breed in their three to four weeks alive as adults, they won't be able to breed at all. So they need a healthy environment to keep on living and to keep reproducing. Right. Speaking of their environment, this butterfly is known as a neotropical butterfly, which generally refers to the parts of Southern North America, Central America, and all of South America, which means that this butterfly is found in Central and South America and in parts of Mexico and maybe a little bit at the bottom of Florida. I'm not sure, but that's what neotropical is. So that's probably where they are. Where in the forest will we find them? The female blue morpho butterflies like to hang out a lot closer to the floor of the forests, and they'll sort of chill on tree stumps normally, but they do move closer to the tree canopies when it's time to lay their eggs, which is why they need the canopies to be kind of solid and taken care of as well and healthy and whatnot, or else they have nowhere to lay their eggs. Right. The males, they like to fly a lot higher up or in more open places. Like if there's like a stream or a river, usually there's not going to be a tree in the dead center of the river. So they'll fly around in the streams and whatnot because it's a more open spot. They also, all of these butterflies are usually seen a lot more at the beginning and the ending of the wet rainy season. Specifically, they're seen a lot more in Cerrado, which is located in, Br in Brazil, in um, South America. And they don't really like flying during the wet season because the rain can be very damaging, even if their wings are hydrophobic, it's still large droplets compared to their tiny size. Droplets of rain are tiny for us, but they're not for butterflies. Yeah, that can kill them. It's like it's like planes with birds. Birds are like tiny for us and tiny for the planes, but they can still be pretty damaging. <laughs> yeah, perspective. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if it does rain and they are still out and about and whatnot, they'll try to hide in little hidey holes and inside trees and under rocks and whatnot. So you might like see just a cluster of little butterflies in a little outcropping or something if it's raining outside. Mm -hmm. Obviously not here. They don't like Texas, but. <laughs> <laughs> not New York either. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, they're so pretty. I wish they were here. We do know that there are lots of different butterflies in the Morpho genus, but there really isn't a consensus on just how many there are. We think it's maybe about 30 to 75, but again, we aren't really too sure. Butterflies, while being very um, bright and pretty, are kind of hard to study because despite them being so pretty, for one, they only live a few weeks as adults. So if we keep them too long, then they won't reproduce at all, and we don't want to harm the population. But on top of that, they can be kind of hard to catch. They're tiny insects. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> So we aren't really sure exactly how many. We just know that there's a good chunk of butterflies that are all a part of this genus. Interesting. And there are, for those who doesn't know, there are 17,500 species of butterflies in the world. There's so many butterflies. We also aren't really super sure exactly what their conservation status is because we don't really have that much information on them. We do know that people like to catch them and whatnot, but we aren't sure exactly how many there are in the wild right now. There was something I did find called the Butterfly Conservation Initiative, and it seemed to help these butterflies as well as many others, but I can't really find any information on it. So if you do find out about it, then I would definitely look into that. In general, any kind of forest conservation efforts that help the rainforest and help animals in the rainforest, I imagine that would not hurt them and would probably help them, to be honest. So if you'd like to help these specific butterflies, then I would just look into rainforest conservation efforts. Yes. Butterflies are key components with their ecosystems and are effective in detecting ecological change due to their sensitivities to the forest disturbance. 
especially in association with specific food and, and plant, as you were mentioning. Butterflies are, uh, they're, they're a major pollinator, a lot like um, bees and some other insects. So you think of bees, you think of pollination and them going flower to flower to help pollinate them. But butterflies also do the same thing. Because while these butterflies like to eat uh, fruits off the forest floor, many butterflies will eat flower nectar, which means they'll land on the flower, they'll pick up pollen, and then they'll move to another flower and replace more pollen and that helps pollinate the flowers and helps them reproduce. Also, uh, whenever they're larvae, they will uh, add to the nutrient cycle of wherever they live, including the rainforests, and that helps to feed the plants and take care of the plants, and which also helps them to reproduce more and helps to feed other animals themselves. So despite them being so small, they're a very, very important part of their ecosystems, just like any other animal or insect or even plant. Mm-hmm. I know that you mentioned that uh, butterflies can be good indicators of when something's gone wrong, and that is that is very, very true. Butterflies, as well as other insects, can be very good indicators because they're so small and delicate, and they're very dependent on their environment, just being healthy in general. The only difference between butterflies and other insects is it's easier to see and identify butterflies. I can just see a butterfly flying, and I'll be like, oh, that's a monarch butterfly right there because they have very unique patterns and whatnot. So you can see which butterflies are where, and that can help you understand whether the environment that they live in is healthy or not, because if they're supposed to be there and they're there, then that's wonderful. If they're supposed to be there and you don't see any, then there's probably something wrong. So, Right, sensitive to any change in the ecosystem, right. Mm -hmm. There's a phrase that people like to use called a canary in the coal mine. Years before, whenever we uh, were less technologically advanced, I suppose, uh, how people would find out if their uh, mine was damaged or unhealthy in some ways. They would bring a canary down with them. And the canaries are really loud and they're very tiny and they're very delicate. And so if there uh, happened to be like a gas leak or uh, a cave-in and there was no oxygen or something like that, the canary would feel it and be affected a lot faster than we will because it's a lot smaller than us. So a canary would be talking and and chirping and whatnot and if they just stopped hearing that then they would get worried because there might be something wrong and so they would evacuate the mine and usually that would indicate something's wrong and they could figure it out so a lot of times when people say um that butterflies are the canary in the coal mine for environmental distress that's what they mean right obviously that's not a good thing for the canary but you know it's still something that helped us understand what uh, indicator was and um despite them being indicators for uh, many, many, many years, because again, they're very, being very easy to identify and them being them needing their environment to be healthy, we still are looking into them via studies and uh, research endeavors and whatnot because they're still so small and hard to find. So there's, there's always something more we can learn from them. Right. I mean, as you said, scientists use butterfly population and behavior shifts as metrics for changes in problems in local and global environments. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. This all kind of ties into um, biodiversity in general or biological diversity. And biodiversity is basically just how many different species of organisms live in a specific area. For instance, if you have a yard and you live in a city or something and you only have one type of grass in your yard, maybe a few worms, possibly a few weeds. Everybody has weeds. Your yard, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your yard has a very low biodiversity. But if you look at places like the coral reefs in Australia or the rainforest, have they all have high, very, very high levels of biodiversity. There's different species everywhere. You could take one snapshot and there's probably hundreds. Mm-hmm in that snapshot. Because of this, it's a very important thing to study and focus on, because without it, the Earth would be basically doomed. I mean, we need biodiversity. Every little insect, every tiny plant, every annoying gnat has its place, and it's it, it, they all put something into the ecosystem. Even mosquitoes. I hate, I hate mosquitoes. I live in Texas, they're everywhere. I can't grill outside without being swarmed. <laughs> it's horrible. But I may not like them, but their larva is used a lot to help feed certain fish that eat it. In fact, actually, guppies are one of those. If you ever own guppies, guppies will eat mosquito larva. And um, guppies are also, like, everywhere. Um, but those fish that eat the larva will help to feed other fish, which might help add to the nutrient cycle, which is important to the plants around it, which will feed other animals. 
and on and on and on and on and on and it's 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 a cycle for a reason it literally continuously goes around everything adds something in there right and we are part of it too as long as we maintain being part of it and not overcome it mm -hmm. even if you're not someone who just really likes nature and really likes animals it's still important to you you can't just ignore that it's a thing so many different organisms take part in the upkeep of our world specifically and we can't do it alone especially with the technology we have now which is why so many different scientists and wildlife organizations push for help with like climate change and more common knowledge about animals and their function and natural in our own natural existence it's actually partially why i like to help people learn more about them because maybe it'll teach them to be a little bit more cautious about, you know, using pesticides or, you know, trying to trap raccoons or something like that. I don't know. And the rainforest um, specifically is, is really, really interesting too, because despite the fact that it looks very large and complicated, it survives on a very, very delicate, continuous cycle of nutrients. So the rainforest, the trees and the plants and the animals and everything, they all add into this little nutrient cycle. Whenever that cycle is broken, it's extremely hard to kind of bring it back up to its former glory. There's something uh, that happens that's called clear cutting. That's when uh, people will take a portion of the rainforest and they'll cut down all the trees in that spot and they'll get rid of all the stumps and they'll use the nice fertile soil to grow their plants. And um, I think palm oil is actually something that is grown by clear cutting and it's used in like Oreos and all sorts of different things to help with the preservation of the food and whatnot. Unfortunately, whenever they're done using the fertile soil, because the rainforest itself isn't helping the nutrient cycle continue, it just stops and the soil becomes arid and there's nothing there. In fact, that's actually called desertification. It basically turns into like a tiny desert because there's nothing can grow there. It doesn't have the cycle it needs to continue to be fertile, which means they'll go clear cut some more forest, which cuts down on the forest and breaks the cycle again. Mm -hmm. That's something that is a part of our everyday grocery shopping, and a lot of people don't even know that. And it's still very important to the rainforest, but it still happens all the time. And one way may ask you, so why don't, don't you just replant there? Well... Some people do try to replant it there, but because it has been broken already, it needs the soil to be back to where it was, as well as the animals to live where they did, for the cycle to continue where it left off. Whenever you just replant there, it's obviously wonderful that there's now some trees growing again, but their soil isn't what it needs to be, and so they have a harder time surviving and trying to fix the soil themselves, and there's not animals there because there wasn't rainforest there, so why would the animals go there? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? So yeah. it's, it's a lot better to honestly just not do it in the first place, which I know is not an option in many places, but it's very hard to bring back from the brink, if that makes sense. Yes, and it also takes more time versus... That's that much time that that area is not going to be contributing to its, its nutrient cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we need biodiversity specifically in our own lives as well. And um, there's many different examples of that too. And people don't believe me all the time when I tell them that. But we need nutrient cycles in general to help our plants grow. If they don't have a good you know, soil, like I said, they don't, they, it's going to be harder for them to grow and they won't be as healthy. We need pollinators like butterflies and bees to help our plants grow. Um, there's actually a story about a farmer I'd read once that um, he would always help his, uh, his nearby farmers to give them good seeds because they're going to cross pollinate using insects and he wants his plants to be good. Therefore, he wants his surrounding plants to be good. And that's that's a that's a very good example, to be honest, of the pollination, because if you pollinate with non healthy seeds and you have healthy seeds, your own your seeds are only going to be kind of middling at the end. Yeah, um, wow. Everybody knows we need trees to breathe. We also need like algae to breathe and marshes and swamps are also really good uh, formers of different gases that we need in the atmosphere. Uh, in fact, marshes and swamps also help prevent flooding and they'll help act as a drainage area. So an uh, area that might waste away any any building on there the trees and the plants keep it down with the soil and they hold the water in and it prevents the flooding from going where it doesn't need to go mm -hmm. it's everywhere literally biodiversity is everywhere and it is always necessary and when it's not there you can obviously see it because something is broken 
That was fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing. So every time I do an episode with somebody, I always like to ask them what their favorite animal was. And I know we're kind of doing a co-episode. So I would like to ask you what your favorite animal is. Oh, my God. My favorite animal. Can I guess? Is it a butterfly? (laughs) Actually not. (laughs) It's an elephant. I love elephants. Right. I love them too. They are, the reason I, I love them is I, I think they are, no, I not just think, I know that they are highly intelligent animals with complex emotions and feelings and, and compassion and self-awareness. I mean, just one fun fact about them is that they are one of the very few species to recognize themselves in the mirror, which is pretty awesome. That My is dog, really, really, really right? cool. Not many animals do that. <laughs> Yeah, my dog will bark at itself in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen people who have like pet uh, jumping spiders. They'll hold them up to a mirror and the jumping spider will try to intimidate their reflection. And it's so <laughs> funny. <laughs> and and if we're going back to trees, they, they help maintain the forest and savanna ecosystems for other species. And they're integrally tied to rich biodiversity. If we're going back to what we talked. And they are super important as ecosystem engineers they make pathways in dense forest habitats that allow passage for other animals, which I think is awesome. That is That's really my cool. favorite. In fact, um, I'm actually trying to write a uh, review article on human effects on the rainforest. So I really liked this topic because it helped me. I already knew a lot about it. It super surprised me because someone did a, a report on animals and the rainforest and one of those animals was an elephant and that super surprised me because I was not expecting an elephant to live in a rainforest that does not make sense in my head I know I know <laughs> it's hard to grasp but it's true <laughs> Sky what is your favorite tree my favorite tree is called the rainbow eucalyptus tree and uh, its scientific name is eucalyptus deglupta it's also called a rainbow gum tree, and it lives in like the Philippines and Indonesia and Papua New Guinea and whatnot. And mm-hmm. it's actually the only eucalyptus species that um, lives in the rainforest in some cases. And it's really, really pretty. If you've ever, if you've never seen it, it's sort of like a, it's got kind of like a light orange tinted bark. But whenever the bark is like peeled away, I think it's the sap that makes it rainbow colored because it'll have like red and green and blue and stuff. Wow. Like all just dripping down it. It's so pretty. It is absolutely yeah. beautiful. Sounds stunning. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Sky. That was fascinating and fun. And I appreciate you sharing so many interesting facts on butterflies and the rainforest. And uh, I know I've learned a thing or two. I'm sure you guys did too. I really appreciate you having me. It was it was a lot of fun to to kind of talk with someone about it too. I don't usually have that. I'm usually just the only one. And thank you everyone for joining me today. We are all beautiful butterflies, each in his and her individual ways. I wanted to thank you for joining me today in this episode. I really appreciate you coming on this journey with me and I hope you can join me next time. And remember, it only takes a small action to make a big difference. Be a butterfly. And that's all for this episode. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to hear more of our stories of change. 